So moving over to to Jerry, you've got an even different background. Walk us walk us through it, man. I mean, we know how you guys met now. So well, take us back. We'll, we'll elaborate more on how we met, but uh, yeah. Um, b- believe it or not, the, contrary to what you just said, um, it's not that much of a difference in the background that we've had. Um, I also grew up uh, in California. A uh, family of two immigrants, uh, both uh, La Frontera de Mexico from Tijuana and Rosarito. So mom from Rosarito, my dad from Tijuana. Um, uh, and and, and well, that's what's funny. And uh, I was born in the States. Uh, my family ended up immigrating eventually uh, the right way. They came over. They got work visas. They worked their asses off. They worked in the fields. They worked in factories. They both had two, three jobs at a time. I never got to see my family. I was always at home either with my older siblings. Um, like we, we grew up poor. We grew up dirt poor. But I didn't know I was poor. I just knew I had shoes you know a roof over my head and you know and i had i had food and i was like okay i'm just a typical you know hispanic family growing up in south in uh, south la um from there uh i kind of knew that uh i wanted to do law enforcement from a very very young like time and m- most of it um came from the area that i grew up in i grew up in a very high crime area uh, like right next to Compton, uh, mm-hmm. a city named Paramount. I know Paramount. Yeah, Paramount's, it's it's a, it's a if you break it down, Paramount's more of an industrial city. It's uh, east of, or no, west of Downey. Uh, it's south of Downey. South, okay. Yeah, south of Downey, um, which is literally the city adjacent to Compton. Right. Right next to uh, Rancho Dominguez, right next to Long Beach, right next to Norwalk. So, right. like, it's a two by three mile city, yep. really small, but extremely like populated and the majority of it is is hispanics it's mostly hispanic so all the the people that i knew in that area were all gang members all gang members they grew up in and out of jail juvie um the cousins that i grew up with directly that lived in the same apartment that i lived in uh were in and out of juvenile hall all the time drugs you know fucking doing like and when i say drugs i don't mean just like weed like they were doing hardcore shit and um my dad and my mom used to whoop my ass when I used to hang out with them. Like whoop my ass. Good. But as a kid, I'm like, I'm like, I want to hang out with my cousins. Right. I want to hang out with the kids. I don't want to be locked up in the house. Like this is boring, dude. Um, but then I started getting a very bad like distaste towards stuff like that. Like at a very very young age, I got mugged a bunch of times walking to school. You know, this, this is me in second grade walking to school. In second grade, you're how old in second grade? Seven? I can't math yeah. well. I can't math yeah. well either. But right. seven years old, and I'm walking to school by myself. Different times, obviously. You know, I, w- I would not even allow my 11 year old kid to go to school, even if I could see, see him right. walking to school. It's just the yeah. way it is. Yeah. Uh, but back then, parents were like, "Hey, I'm going to work. Um, here's your lunch, and see you later. See you later. I'll see you tonight at seven for lunch or for dinner." So different times. I'm sure you you were kind of the same. Uh, you and I have talked about this a lot. Um, and I, and like during those times I got into fights, I was hanging out with the wrong crowds and I started seeing like how bad it was in the area and, uh, I would get beat up. I would get mugged by gangsters and the cousins that I did grow up with. Um, and the older I got, the the more I noticed, like, this is going to be a very bad decision if I continue working with them, if I continue like hanging out with them. And then one time when I was really young, um, one of my cousins, uh, he goes, hey, we're going to go to a friend's house. And I, I want to say I was like nine or ten. He was like, we're going to my friend's house. He was like two years older than me. And um, he goes, hey, uh, carry this stuff. And he gives me something. And I look at it. And it's, it, it was an ice pick. And I go, there's no ice where we're going. And he goes, just put it in your pocket. It's cool. Don't worry about it. I'm like, all right, cool. All right. And this is like... 10 30 11 o'clock at night walking down we get hemmed up by local sheriffs code three turn on their lights a bunch of 10 year olds out of what what at, time of night like 10 30 11 o'clock right, yeah. in that neighborhood right? yeah in the hood and we're like okay hems us up and uh i had the ice pick in my uh my hoodie sweater this is not gonna end well uh, and I'm, i have it right here tucked in and when he said hey put your hands on the hood 
I, I did this, and for some reason at nine ten, I go okay, and the ice pick flies like ten yards that way. Shit. And the lights were on, siren was on, so he didn't hear it, he didn't see it. Get hemmed up, and I remember uh, he's like, "What the fuck are you guys doing out here? Like, you should be home. You should be ashamed of yourselves." Blah 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 blah. And my cousin's just giving him a lip. You cop, right. you pig. And I'm like looking, and I'm like, "Fuck, why am I hanging out with this guy? Like, this is my blood. This is my cousin, legit cousin." But I'm like, oh, "Fuck, he's gonna get me in trouble, dude." And the cop comes up to me. He goes, "How old are you? Like, where do you live?" Like. I'm like, oh, I live over there. All right. Throws him, throws us in the back of the squad car, and he drops us off to each individual house. I didn't get caught. Well, with that. he takes I, you home. He takes me home. Talks to my mom and dad. And he goes, you know, he's he's out and about. He's you know doing bad shit, and uh, you need to keep a, a watchful eye on him. Obviously, my mom and dad kicked this shit out of me yeah. that night, and um, that's when I kind of got like a lot of respect for cops. I'm like, oh. Okay, like I need to step away from this lifestyle, and that's what I want to do when I grow up. Uh, so that, that was like my first real taste of like law enforcement. So that's interesting. Like, I mean, that's a that's a pretty intense situation. I mean, what you did with your arms really probably could have dictated what had happened with you for a long, long time. Oh yeah, right. So you dodge a bullet, and you you your dot the bullet is under like really kind of not so great circumstance. And I think that could, I mean, that could influence you one of two ways. It's interestingly interesting that it influenced you in the way where you wanted to know more about being a police officer oh, yeah. versus yeah. like, fuck these guys. And, like they're just out ruining my life at 10 years old. And, and I think also it was how he treated me, that off, that deputy. Like he treated me with, he scolded me. I was a young kid. He scolded me, rightfully so. But then he said, let me just take you home and let me have a, a word with your parents. And I think that, like, I grew even more respectful towards law enforcement after that. I wish I wish parents would allow this to happen to their kids more often. Like, instead <laughs> of protect, well, we could probably get into that later. Oh but. yeah, I'm actually glad to hear that though, because yeah, I, I personally know a few people uh, that give cops a bad rap, and they have their own experiences to say that. Yep. You know, um, but I don't feel like enough people have stories like the one you just told. Well, that's really cool. I mean, that's well, just they don't tell them. Yeah, yeah, yeah they probably don't tell. Saying. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, so, fast forward a little bit more. Um, my mom passed away at a very young age. Uh, I was only twelve at the time. So my dad became very, very um, how do how do you say per, like overprotective of me, like super overprotective. So I didn't even get to go out anymore. You know, the hell with going out with, to, to friends' house. He would drop me off at school. He was super, super overprotective. Uh, my sister came back into the, the the family. Not that she was gone, but she had been married already. She was a lot older than I was, like 13, 14 years older than me. Um, so she came in and she kind of became the mother figure for us, helped us around the house, et cetera. And I started noticing that my cousins, the same cousins that I used to hang out with, were, again, in and out of jail, were just doing drugs, were just really, really, really bad to the point where um, – one of them is now in prison for three counts of murder. Uh, one of them is dead. The other one's a drug addict. Uh, another one uh, like committed atrocious, you know, felonies, you know, for the good of their gang or whatever. And I, I'm like, I'm not going to follow this anymore. I'm not going to follow this path. I so, can't do this. So I got, I got a question, man. So you're, you've made this decision consciously, or at least in your ten year old brain or twelve year old brain. Yeah. Like I'm not going to be like that. Well, is it a combination of things? Because clearly your cousins didn't get the same message. Yeah. Right? Because what you just said there is some pretty serious shit. I mean, dead, in jail, in prison, the, that's no way to live your life. No. Right? So no. what was the difference? Um, I, I think a combination of a few different things. So one, my mother passing away. I had a really young brother as well that I kind of had to look after. Um. My pops kicking my ass okay. uh, quite a bit, you know. But it, I know, I know it was out of love. Like he would whoop me, but it was out of love, and I would learn. I would learn from my mistakes, and the fact that I don't know why I think it has to do with my mother passing away at a very young age that I was able to mature faster, and I was able to to, to look at somebody's mistakes and go, Nah, man, I I don't want to do that. I don't want to follow that lifestyle. Like peer pressure or not, I don't want to follow that lifestyle. I think my mom's gonna be very embarrassed with me. If, if she was around, she'd probably kick my ass. Like, 
let's step away. Let's let's look at the bigger picture. Like I have to make my dad proud, my brother proud, my older siblings that have been raising me proud. Like, yeah, that's not my lifestyle. I need to walk away from that. Yeah, got you. I mean, there's a respect level there, right? And you're also forced to take on responsibility, forced to be accountable to your actions, and whether that's being picked up by the sheriff's deputy being taken home or getting an ass whooping from your dad. One way or another, there's actions and there's consequences. Correct. And the consequence for you was if I don't look out for my little brother, right, then nobody's going to look out for him. Yeah. Right. And or if I fuck up, my dad's going to whip my ass. Neither of those th two things are good. No, not at all. Sorry. So it drives decision making in a little bit of a different way versus mom and dad protecting you all the time or trying to solve your problems for you and or not allowing you to be exposed to the things that happen in the very, the very real things that happen in, in the world and in your right outside your front door. Yeah. Right. That's um, I mean, that's powerful because I think it, it speaks largely to who I know you are at this point. I haven't known you that long, but man, I mean, that's just another one of these examples of people struggling early and you look at that in the end as a blessing, right? That you had to struggle that way. Like you had to get fucked up. Like you, you had to make those mistakes. And whether you were allowed to make those mistakes or not, you, you, or whatever, however you want to look at that, you were forced to be accountable to those in some way. And you come out the other side, and you have choices to make. And that's on you. And you choose to continue to fuck up yeah. or uh, well, you choose well, a different path. Well, what ended up happening this, I'm going to fast forward. Um, I was 17, 18, uh, 17, 16, 17 in high school. And I was still exposed to a lot of the stuff that we talked about already. And I, I told myself, okay, when can I join law enforcement? I was like oblivious to what age you could join law enforcement, like what it takes. I, I you know, I thought it was like, you sign an application. Here's your gun. Here's a badge. Here's some training. And there it is. Um, and then I later found out, I'm like, no, you have to be 21 to join to law enforcement. You know, it's particularly in California, or I think it's nationwide actually. And um, you have to um, do X, Y, and Z. You have to have some life experience. It's not like they're going to pick up a librarian. A librarian's going to apply and, okay, yeah, you go to the academy. Like they want some kind of background. Um, kind of, yeah. Well, we'll get into that later. Um, so I decided, I said, okay, well, from when I graduate high school until 21, what, what do I do with my life? Like I've already been exposed to so much crap. And if I don't have something that drives me towards that end goal, like I'm going to get in trouble. Caught up in it. I'm yeah. going to get caught up in it and I don't want to stay here. And I'm like, okay, what do I do? And I started talking to my friends and my friends like, join the Marine Corps. And I was like, what the hell is the Marine Corps? Like, oh, it's the military. I was like, oh, like the army? And they're like, no, no, it's the Marine Corps. I'm like, okay, like, where, where do we go for this? Oh, we got to go to a recruiting station. I'm like, all right, cool. Yeah, sure. I had no idea, like, what the Marine Corps was. I didn't know anything. Wow. I, I just knew the army and, and the Navy because my cousin had joined the Navy when I was younger, too. Um, and, but that's all I knew. Like, I knew there was the army and the Navy. I was oblivious to everything else. Um, so I went to a recruiting station. They were busy. Went back home. And then recruiters started showing up at my house, and the dude was wearing dress blues. Pretty sharp. You're like, oh, oh cool, dress blues. Those are cool looking. Young and impressionable. You know, young and impressionable. That's what it was. And it's, it's a ploy. You know, they want to impress, you know, the kids and whatnot. And I'm like, oh, that's the Marines? Like, okay, like, what is that? And I started, talked to the recruiters. His name was Sergeant Pedraza at the time. Um, he took me to the station. He took actually like six of us from high school. Was like, we're all six friends um, that we knew each other. We went to the same classes. We all grew up in Paramount. Uh, we went and we signed up. And uh, at 17, at the time, you still needed your, your consent from your, your guardian okay. or your, your father. Um, so I, I told him I wanted to sign up. And, and he says, well, I need your dad to sign on this. I go, okay, well, let's go talk to my dad. My dad's going to be totally fine with it. And I go, my dad goes, que la chingada no. <laughs> which means hell no and I'm like well why not he goes well no 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 no. I already lost your mom and I'm not going to lose you too oh wow and I'm like how the hell are you going to lose me I'm just going to join the military and he goes no no no, no. 
the, the Marines, uh, you go and die. I'm like, I was still oblivious to what the Marine Corps was. You know, I, I just thought I was joining the military. And I didn't know like there was jobs and different occupations and MOSs. I had no idea. Um, and I told him, okay, well, here's your ultimatum. You either sign when I'm 17 and you give me consent and I'll be happy, or I sign when I'm 18 and I will never forgive you for this. It's like that. I told him, it was just like that. And he looked at me and goes, all right, let me chew on this one. And then the next day he signed away. He had the, the, he signed away. He goes, here's the thing. I'm going to go to church and I'm going to pray for you. And, and you better not do anything stupid. And I go, okay, cool. Yeah, whatever. I'm going to join the military. I want to get away from this. This is stupid. Like this lifestyle is stupid. I want to get away from it because ultimately I want to be a cop. And I don't know why he was okay with me being a cop, but me not okay with joining the military. It's like right, really right. weird. I'm like, dad, do you not know? Like it's pretty dangerous out here. Um, so I, I went and I, I signed up, I joined and then nine 11 happened like okay. two, two, like three months after so I had signed my contract up to the dates, which was going to be my question yeah, exactly. like, I had the same because you know, being oblivious to Marine Corps and military and all that stuff. Yeah. Pre nine 11, there wasn't much unless you were paying attention to what was going on in you know, in Iraq through desert storm and desert shield, but it hadn't, it wasn't getting sensationalized. Right, and certainly we hadn't had an event like nine nine eleven yet to wake the kids up to what was really going on over there. I mean, I was hyper aware, but now correct me if I'm wrong. Afghanistan was already going on in two thousand one, right? Yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. two thousand uh, two thousand one. Afghanistan was already happening, but hey, I didn't even know Afghanistan was a place, you know, at the time, let alone the Marine Corps. Yeah, I think so, a lot of people in the same same situation, yeah. man. So I think would... they only know it for a certain way it is now. Like, I'm forty seven years old. I'm literally old enough to remember how fucked up it's been forever, yeah. right? Uh, forever. And um, you have to know U.S. history, I guess. Yeah. But if they're not teaching you that shit in school and you're not getting that from your parents, well, of like, how not. would you know? Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. So so, so I joined and um, got to the point where the recruiter goes, well, what MOS do you want? I go, well, I had, I had just looked up what the Marine Corps was. And I go, oh, infantry. Cool. That's what I want to do. And I'd already done my uh, my uh, my uh, ASVAB. ASVAB. Yeah, yeah, I did my ASVAB. I scored pretty decently. Um, and the recruiter goes, "Well, you qualify for every job. You, know, you got a pretty good ASVAB score." Um, he goes, "You could do whatever you want. You could do intel. You could do comms. You could do motor T. You could do this. You could do that. Uh, you shouldn't do infantry." I go, "No, but but I want to do infantry." He goes. No, 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 no. Like I was a calm guy, and that's something that you know is very applicable in the civilian world. Like, do you plan on doing this for the rest of your life? I go, no, no, no. I want to be a cop afterwards. He goes, I right, well, this is just a stepping stone for me to not get in trouble anymore, and also maybe learn some life skills because I have zero life skills outside of what I've done when I was young. He goes, no, no, no. no. Um, you, you want to do what I did? You want to do calm, or you want to do something else? You could do intel. You could do this. You could learn something in the military besides just be infantry. I go, no, no, no I want to be infantry. He goes, no, I'm not going to let you do it. I'm not going to let you do it. And I go, Why, okay. Because he had a quota to fill? Probably. Yeah. Uh, probably, in hindsight. I don't know if that even exists in the military. Was there, is there quotas for MOSs? Okay, so I guess there is. Yeah. So that's how oblivious I was to it. And I go, okay, well, I'm going to join the, the Army. It's literally like oh, no down shit. the hallway. So now you're pulling the same shit you pulled uh, on, on my dad. I go, I'm joining the <laughs> Army then. It worked once. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's he the goes, same shit you tried to pull on me on the <laughs> <guy> earlier, dude. <laughs> no, I was pulling guard. Is what I was doing. That's different. Um, so I'm like, okay, I'm just going to join the army. And I walk out and he runs out. No, 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 Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. Um, okay, I'll tell you what. You want to join the infantry. Okay. Chew on this. Um, go open contract. And more than likely, um, they'll choose you to, to be infantry. Well, what I didn't know is that open contract is whatever the Marine Corps wants whatever you to do, say, whatever yeah. their needs are. I'm stupid. I'm young. I'm 17. I go, will it solidify a position in the in in infantry? He goes, you'll have a high probability of joining the infantry. Bullshit. I go, okay, cool. Yeah, mm-hmm. I didn't know. I'm I, 17. I, I, know. I didn't know. I, I didn't know shit. I didn't know. I go, okay, so I, you're not letting me join the infantry, but you're letting me go open contract, and I have a chance Remember that? Remember Dumb and Dumber's? So you're saying I have a Dude, chance. I remember, it's only the top five. Uh, right. So that, that was me. That was me. I go, so I have a chance, right? 
He goes, oh yeah, yeah, you have a really high probability uh, that you're gonna you're gonna get chosen to be infantry. I go, cool, I'll sign up then. Signed up, uh, went to basic, and uh, this was I signed up in 2001 July. Um, I left June July of 2002. So 9/11 happened during that time. It happened after I had signed up, so I didn't join the military because of 9/11. Mm-hmm. But it did, like, once it happened, I said, okay, yeah, I'm going to the Marines. I'm Like, I'm going to do what I need to do. And then I go to boot camp, and then I end up going to MCT. And MCT. What is that? MCT is just, um, it's, it's not infantry. <laughs> it's not infantry. You learn, like, basic rifle skills and basic, like, land nav. Um, but it's, like, right after boot camp. And then at the very end, when you graduate MCT, which is, I want to say it's, like, a month long, they give you your MOS. They they call you. Okay, uh, Munoz, you are a cook. Uh, Scott, you're gonna be a uh, bulk fuel. Uh, B Dub, oh, you're going infantry. Jer- uh, Perez, oh, that was, that's me. Ammunition. What the fuck is ammunition? What do you mean ammunition? Wait, oh, wait. ammunition tech. So you did do the general open contract. Oh yeah. Yeah. So oh, he yeah. say that? I'm yeah, sorry, that so he did. Yeah, I so did. he went open, yeah. thinking that he was going to be infantry. Thinking that I was like, oh, I'm going to have a high probability to do infantry. So I was pogue as hell in the, in the Marine Corps, just FYI. But well, you have to explain pogue. Then. You know, you know that term. I've heard the term. Somebody else used it on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, but it wasn't defined. So pogue is people other than grunts. Okay, okay, got you. So yeah, it's 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 a derogatory term, but it's not derogatory. So to me. I don't interesting, this the story of this guest that, that that I was talking to. She was in the army, and her dad was special forces. He was a sniper, special forces, and he went down. And, and by the way, mom was actually a ranger. Um, yeah, airborne. Sorry, she was airborne. One of the first, and maybe the first female that should be accepted. Um, anyhow, the long story short is, is like dad went down to the recruiting office and basically bullied. The recruiter into making sure she got what he thought she should have which ends up making her a pug but turns out that's what she probably should have been doing anyways yeah. so anyways uh the naive kid walking in the recruiter's office not knowing and sort of being influenced or not bullied i'm not going to say that almost tricked I was I mean, definitely. Tricked. I mean, this sounds pretty tricked. fucking shady, no. right? Yeah, You're talking I was about a, you know, a kid's life, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, he didn't care. So, what is Quotas. munitions? Uh, so, ammunition tech is um, we pretty much handle nomenclature lots of all munitions pertaining to infantry, um, artillery, uh, tank units in the Marine Corps, with the exception of air um, air assets. Okay. So, we didn't deal with the air side of the munitions. Uh, we had other techs that were specifically for aircraft munitions. So all the ammunition that I dealt with uh, was for either workups or for deployments. So I was in charge of, we went to Redstone Arsenal, which is a, a, a base, an army base in Alabama. And that's where we, we learned our, our MOS uh, designation. And then from there, I was attached to um, a, a unit where we just helped with the workups. So the first year in, in my fleet time in the Marine Corps, I spent in 29 Palms, which sucks, by the way. It's, it's the West Coast armpit of the Marine Corps. <laughs> and um, middle of nowhere, nothing but, you know, hills have eyes, people living out and about. It's a really weird place. Um, I think they had like one one restaurant, one bar at the time. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Character you know, builder. Experience. Exactly. And uh, I was just sick and tired of being there. And OIF had just kicked off so basically what you're doing is you're giving the ammunition to the guys that you wanted to be yeah uh, so you're exactly. basically like here it was, have a great fucking time doing what i signed up hoping i was gonna it was a doing. slap in the face dude yeah. it was a complete slap That's in the face so so we had guys half of the guys and gals that um were in my unit on uh, my first year in the fleet got selected to go to iraq for oif one and i'm like I was trying to volunteer. I'm like, I, that's what I want to do. I want to go. I want to go. Since I'm not infantry, let me at least go on a deployment. And it was like, no. Again, a big fuck no. I'm like, fuck. Okay. So I stayed behind. And uh, most of the infantry uh, battalions in 29 Palms had already deployed, mm-hmm. come back for rotation, et cetera, et cetera. My mass sergeant at the time, um, I, I somehow, after a year of being there, convinced him that I needed to deploy 
somewhere. I, I needed to deploy with an infantry unit so that I could go overseas. Cause at that time I'm like, now I need to go do something. I need to get out of here. Like I'm all my homies are going to Iraq or Afghanistan and I'm here in the rear and I need to do something before I get out of the Marine Corps. Cause I knew that I wasn't going to do more than four years. I said, I'm, I'm after I'm, my four years at 21 and get out and I get out so I could do law right. enforcement, but I wanted to have a little bit more life, life experience, I guess, whatever. Um, so I finally convinced my mass sergeant to, to get me orders to become an ammo tech at an infantry battalion on the so East you're coast. Getting closer. So I'm getting closer <laughs> to what I still <laughs> not going to be able to do. But, yeah. Still yeah. not going to be able to do, but regardless, he got me orders and I ended up going to first battalion, second Marines out of Camp Lejeune. So I get there. I'm, 19 and a half and 19 and a half, almost, yeah, 20, 19 and a half, 20. Okay. And they go, hey, you're in charge of all the ammunition for the whole battalion. Uh, I'm like, how many is in a battalion? It's like a thousand, a 1,200? Yeah, a lot. A lot, like, a, a, like 1,200 Marines. And this is Alpha Company, Bravo, Charlie, Weapons Company, um, H&S, everybody that's in the battalion to include any of the support element of people. I was put in charge of all their ammunition. I'm like, I'm, I'm a 19 and a half, 20 year old kid that barely knows how to do any of this. And I have to deal with everybody's ammunition. Right. And we're talking like millions of dollars, millions and millions of dollars of ammunition. assets, yeah. assets and people that you're dealing with at very high levels. I'm sure. Right. I, oh, the only people I had to answer to were the, the company, um, gunnies, the company, um, lieutenants and my gunner. I mean, these are the guys that are making the decisions about what's happening on the battlefield. Right? These are the guys that are that are. So let me rewind a little bit. So the ammunition that I dealt with for the battalion when I was still Conus here at state side yeah. was all it was all training ammo. And not until I actually ended up going to Iraq with the, with with one, two that I have to deal with all the ammunition for each individual uh, company right. uh, for, for okay. actual, the, you know, field use or for wartime use. Uh, but I, we, you know, I was out there with every single company during their workups, um, supplying them with what they needed. But I only dealt with the the top dogs of each company, I guess. Okay. Um, and again, I only answered to a handful of people: my gunner and my battalion commander, which was a, a, a lieutenant colonel. Um, and so, yeah, so you're, you're dealing with people at an executive level. Correct. Right. So you're on. You're grunt so to speak but you're no it wasn't right grunt. you're dealing with the you're dealing with the yeah the upper echelon so there's a different level of communication correct right um brian's already identified that you can't spell or write an email so clearly the military didn't teach you that <laughs> oh no didn't, i don't know where you got that right? i didn't teach you that i was really good with excel that's yeah, right. about it okay, okay. so spreadsheets so, for days spreadsheets for days yeah that's also fact, that's also fact. fact. yeah yeah, they're not good with numbers or Excel so, spreadsheets now. Interesting, yeah, the learning that's going on. Uh, so, again, fast forward a little bit. Yep. We, end, we ended up going to Iraq um, 2005, 2006 uh, with the 22nd Mew. So we actually got on naval ships, passed through the Suez Canal. Uh, well, before that, we went to Djibouti for a little bit. They did some workups. Um, 22nd Mew had um, 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines, some RD units, um, or battalion, I'm sorry, some tanks with us some um, other elements like special operation elements uh, mostly recon marines uh, either force recon or i don't remember it's force recon or recon which is a little bit different um and uh we ended up going to iraq originally we weren't supposed to go to iraq it was supposed to be a westpac tour uh, we were supposed to like stop at all the different big countries ports, yeah. yeah big ports and whatnot and they said nope we're going to iraq and we stopped in kuwait from Kuwait, we got on airplanes yep. and the Air Force. Thank you, taxi. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, flew us into uh, uh, the Ambar region. Okay. Uh, and then we went to our separate FOBs for almost six months. All right. So you finally got your deployment. I got my deployment. I was in infantry, but I was attached to an infantry battalion. So I guess it was better than nothing. Yeah. So uh, I came back after that. Um, knew that I wanted to. I was at 21 already at the time, almost 22. So I said, okay, life experience, I'm at least 21. Let me apply for a uh, police agency. And the only police agency, even as a child, that I ever, ever, ever wanted to join was LAPD. Yeah. Um, I was broke as hell, though. Came back broke as hell. Didn't have any money. 
And I said, I got presented with an opportunity. And they said, hey, why don't you go overseas again to Iraq as a civilian contractor this time? I go, okay, doing what? And they go, blowing shit up, dude. Okay. I'm like, what do you mean? They go, you're going to be working with EOD guys all the time. You know ammo. You know how to separate ammo, what blows up, what's volatile with what. You know, you know that Red Foss doesn't mix with blah, 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 blah. Right. I'm like, all right, cool. Um, how much do I get paid? About $15,000 a month. And I'm 21. I go, okay, show me where to fucking sign. Let's do this. I go, I'll do this for six months. I'm cool with that. Mm. LAPD can wait. I'm cool with that. I need some money. I need to be a little bit more liquid. Uh, so I went over for six months and I, all I did was work with EOD guys, like Air Force EOD, Navy EOD. Um, so EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal, correct. for people that don't know what that is. Correct. So went, so, so went, went out uh, with the Corps of Engineers, the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, had a contract with the civilian company called EOTech. Um, and all we did was demo shoots on ammunition and confiscated uh, firearms, guns, you just name it that was confiscated from the, either the Taliban or from Something people, that was uncovered some, in some village somewhere. Somewhere that, yeah, they weren't supposed to have. So we would do demo shoots every day for six months. Legitly, we were just blowing millions of dollars worth of ammunition. And I'm like, how the hell are these guys getting all this ammo? And later to find out, it was like a lot of like shady shit. And that's how they're getting all their ammo and stuff. Like we would go into these, um, uh, they call them magazines. They're pretty much bunkers, under, underground bunkers where they store ammunition. And when you look at it from the top view, it just looks like little hills. Yeah. Um, you know what I'm talking about. So I went in there, I'm looking up, and uh, on top, you could see the writing like on the pillars, and it says, parts for bridges. And I go, parts for bridges? Oh, shit, they, they use this, they're illegal funds or illegal equipment that they use or material that they would use to, to build these things. Looking at other boxes, and they had boxes of MP5s lined up, brand new MP5s lined up everywhere that they somehow gotten into country. Somehow. Uh, somehow gotten <laughs> into country. We're opening up other boxes of ammunition. They had Nazi ammunition. They had it, shit World War II. World War II, like Nazi stamped ammunition. I'm like, dude, Iraq was like packed full of all sorts Wild of crazy stuff, this, dude. Uh, my eyes were opening up. I'm like, holy crap, dude. Like, Saddam had some crazy shit over here, dude. I'm sure you heard all the stories about walking into like entire like room sized US bedroom yep. stacked floor to ceiling with hard all bills. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like gold bars. Gold bars. Insane yeah. story. Like read any of the books from the invasion of Iraq or Afghanistan, out of control. I, yeah. I didn't deal with that. I dealt with just the, the weapons, the started, weapons yeah. and the ammunition. And but I'm with all the fires of spirits, like that is more shit to me now, you know. I was yeah. like, holy I'm looking at this, I'm like I wish you have it. This is a full auto MP5, dude. And they had <laughs> in the box crates, yeah. crates yeah. beyond the eye could see of just brand new MP5. And you still, blew it up, and I had to blow it up. Damn, because it was confiscated. I was like, oh, can I just take one? Yeah. Like, I only needs one. <laughs> yeah, how, how much would one of those be worth? Uh, an OG one from 2006, dude. I mean, come on, dude. Like over twelve thousand dollars, probably brand new in a box I like that. They were closer to like forty. Yeah, I was gonna say that okay, like 40, 50. okay. Yeah. There you go. And you blew okay. it up, Jerry. And, and, oh, no, I didn't just blow one up. I blew up hundreds of them. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it was crazy shit, dude. I'm telling you. Just the stuff that I would see, the stuff that was supposed to be used for humanitarian purposes. There was one crate. It was funny. I'm looking at a, a box full of crates, and it says typewriter parts. I go, we're blowing up typewriters? <laughs> and I open it up, hand grenades. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> typewriter parts yeah, these are not typewriter parts dude i'm like oh you shady little guy you um anyway so you're working as a co how long does the contract work work or go? so there were six six months stints um you would do six months um and then you had the choice to come back or go to they would sh if you wanted to go to i don't know dubai or if you wanted to go to london or you wanted to go anywhere they would send you out there you could have fun and then come back so you're making your 300k a rip 15 15k a month for six months we're not really counting here but yeah sure right. I'm, I'm making good money i was making good money per trip that's um, why people do it that's why people were doing it but this is back in the day when like contracting work overseas was actually paying good money i don't think they make that kind of money anymore right uh i mean depends on what you do I let's guess. assume afghanistan's still rocking and rolling right now which obviously it isn't uh yeah no it's it's it took a huge dive yeah uh, probably a 60 percent hit 
from like 2001 to five from and then from five to present it probably took a 60 percent dive well wow. so mo- most of the companies that were out there with us um because remember i wasn't doing like gun stuff out there i was blowing shit up, blowing up so guns. we we had contractors protecting us we had like Triple Canopy, we had Blackwater, gotcha. we had Cochise. Yeah, Co- Cochise was another one, right? Cochise, I think, was another one. We had guys protecting us, and all they did was pump iron, eat, and watch the wire for us. Right. And I was doing the more tech, I guess the more technical stuff was blowing stuff up. Right. Um, but it was paying really good money, and I was like, all right, this is cool. You know, I get to blow stuff up. I get to hang out with dope people. Um, I get to work out and eat for free, and then make, I go home after six. Money. I makes lots of money and go home. And I did, made my money, and I said, I don't need to really be here anymore. And when I made that choice, as I was signing my co- my, my end of contract out there, uh, Saddam got captured. And I'm like, oh, I definitely don't want to stay here then. <laughs> I yeah, definitely want to leave country. Yeah. So I left country, came back, um, applied for LAPD. Yeah, there's a transition here at some point. Right? Yeah, applied for LAPD. Um, and they said, all right, it's going to be a little bit of wait. I said, okay. Um, I'm just going to live my life. I have money in the bank. I'm just going to relax for a while. Finally relax for a while. Uh, they call me a few months later. Um, they tell me, hey, um, you passed backgrounds. Come in. Going through the next part of the process. Go, yeah, go through the next part of the process. I did my, I did my um, interview, my panel interview. I did my polygram, uh, polygraph, I'm sorry, polygraph. Uh, did everything that I needed to do. Mammogram? did my physical, yeah, mammogram too. Okay. I did that. I did three of those actually. Passed that one right? I passed them. Well, failed <laughs> the first one, passed the next two. Um, and then um, go to do the medical portion and there was a hiccup. And I ended up finding out that I have white, Park, white Wolf Parkinson's white syndrome. Uh, and I'm like, well, what the hell is that? I don't know what that is. So uh, it's, it's basically when you're, uh, so the way your heart, be, I'm, I'm not, I don't know anything about the anatomy too well, but the way your heart beats, it's not like you think about it and it beats, right? It just, your brain sends electrical pulses to your heart and it beats for you, right? I mean, that's, at least that's what I, it, it, that's the lamest way. Yeah, your nervous system takes care of it for It you. just takes care of itself. So apparently I have too many connections to my heart and my brain sends too many messages or too many pulses to my heart and okay. it beats irregularly from time to time. This is something that you could see in the EKG. And, and you've never had one before, so you wouldn't have known. I did. I had one in the Marine Corps. Remember, before you go into the Marine Corps at at, at uh, Maps, oh, they they you. make you do an AK, a EKG. Well, I was told that this is something you're born with. So I guess the Marine Corps didn't give a shit, and they just said, "Yeah, you're going in. You're going. You're just not the number. You're going in." LAPD disqualified me though. They said, "No, you can't. You can't go because you're too much of a Your risk. Liability. Your liability. You could croak at any time." You know, you could do some physical stuff. I was like, dude, Here's I just got another back. another hard no. I was like, dude, I just, another hard no. I was like, dude, I just got back from Iraq. I've, you know, I did another tour over there. I was in the Marine Corps boot camp. I was like, I'm healthy, dude. I'm young. I'm 21. Uh, they said, no, you have to get a waiver somehow. And uh, we're not going to help you with that. So for six months, I was like spending my own hard earned cash to try to find a, a doctor that would sign off on a waiver, do stress tests on me. Etc. And then eventually the VA said, I, saw, I went to the VA in, in, um, in LA and they told me, we'll do a stress test on you and we'll sign off if you, if you don't die, I guess. So they did a stress test on me. They said I, I was perfectly fine. I was healthy. I submitted my letter of recommendation to the, he, uh, the head physician for LAPD Medical. And three days later, they called me and said, okay, you're good. You could continue the process. <laughs> Little, but it was just all these hoops that I was jumping through. Such a long road to just get what you want. I mean, yeah, such a long road. Um, joined. I got an acceptance letter literally a few weeks after I passed medical. Mm-hmm. Um, at the time, because I thought I might not be joining LAPD, I was ho- working for Home Depot. Um, oh shit! For three days, and then I quit on the third day because I got that phone call right. from LAPD. Wait, were you working in the store or the parking lot? Yeah. <laughs> I was working. Yeah, I was, I was, yeah, actually, you want, you want to hear something funny? Home Depot sends you to a two day training seminar where you learn all the HR stuff. You learn how to stock stuff. And, and, uh, so I went to two days of training. Third day that I show up to start actually like, oh, you're going to be assigned to your know, paints and hardware or whatever. <laughs> I'm doing my paperwork, my W-9, and, and then all of a sudden they go, my phone rings, and I go, it's LAPD, and I go, hey, sir, um, 
I know it's only my first day officially here, but I quit. <laughs> and they're like, what? I go, I got to accept the Dell APD and I don't want to work for Home Depot. Right, right. And they're like, okay, sure. They had to pay me out cash right, right. because of the two days that I actually worked. And two weeks later, here I am in the academy. Right.